uh, African Institute for, Africa, uh, for Grain Studies in Harare, Zimbabwe, and Action Aid uh, Association in India. Um, my name is Paris Yeros. I am uh, the moderator uh, and one of the organizers of uh, and coordinators of the Agrarian South uh, Network. Um, I uh, briefly uh, explain how this will work and what this is all about before introducing our, our key speaker and uh, Professor Prabhapak Naik and our discussant, Dr. Lynn Osome. Uh, the Agrarian South Network, as you might know, is um, a tricontinental research organization which has been um, uh, growing uh, and uh, being built over uh, over a decade now. Uh, and uh, it, this is the, the brainchild of our late brother and comrade Sam Moyo, who spearheaded the, the, the network uh, from his base in Harare, Zimbabwe, uh, from the 2000s onwards. Uh, and today the network is um, uh, continue, continues to grow. We have a journal since 2012, the Agrarian South Journal, Journal of Political Economy, uh, in uh, research collaboration and um, undertake uh, various book publications. Our most recent book, of course, is our tribute to our brother Sam Moyer. Uh, this is a book uh, called Rethinking the Social Sciences with Sam Moyo, which, we'll, which we had launched in uh, New Delhi earlier this year, and we will do another launch, a global launch here online later this year. Uh, the, our platform for dialogue, which, um, of which this dialogue series is a part, um, is our uh, attempt to put uh, at the disposal of progressive movements and intellectuals um, our, this infrastructure that we have, we have today the depth and breadth to global debate on um, on the evolving crisis, which is a pandemic crisis as well as a deep economic crisis. And um, uh, over a period of time, uh, throughout this year and, and into the year, over the challenges on the challenges as they evolve, the the theme of the platform is specters of crisis, rays of hope. Uh, revolution, liberation, development today. The, the platform for dialogue includes a number of initiatives. There are four, in fact. Uh, this online dialogue series is one. Um, uh, also, we have a research bulletin, which we, we will launch. And this will be uh, under uh, the coordination of Dr. Lino Some, who is with us here today. And uh, uh, we will also do a launch of this later on in the year. There's a special section in our journal, Agrarian South, uh, which will be a, a rolling section, all section, uh, beginning in December throughout next year, and a short book series, uh, uh, which we are also uh, launching with the purpose of popularizing and disseminating uh, in digital format, principally uh, 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 writings and which can have uh, an influence on uh, theory and, uh, and, and, and practice. So that's um, uh, our platform for dialogue. The, this dialogue series uh, involves the, co the core partners of this being, uh, you know, the Agrarian South Network plus the, the Sam Moyo African Institute for Agrarian Studies in Harare, Zimbabwe, and that association in India. Um, uh, I acknowledge uh, Dr. Chambati in Harare and Sandeep in New Delhi who uh, are at the forefront of uh, their respective organizations. I would also thank, I'd like to thank our, our supporting partners, the Center for Informal uh, uh, Sector and Labor Studies at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in, in Delhi, the Program in Political Economy at the Federal University of ABC in Sao Paulo, the Global University for Sustainability in Hong Kong, China, uh, the, the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana, and uh, 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 more partners coming on for uh, as 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 we as we uh, develop, uh, uh, include uh, the nucleus for educational and language technologies at the Federal University of ABC São Paulo, which will eventually um, assist in. Uh, transcribing and 
uh, and, and translating uh, through uh, insertion of subtitles in the videos that will later be posted uh, on our sites. And so that's in a few words, the plan. Uh, the, uh, the, se the session will occur, our sessions will occur in English, but the questions may be through, through the chat on Zoom or Facebook pages, uh, which are being monitored by our by our, our assistants and at, and these will be uh, channeled to us so we can put them into English if they come in other languages and uh, and uh, and uh, and um, facilitate blog in this sense. Um, so that is uh, the few words that I will um, uh, put in here at the beginning. Uh, I will. Um, our, 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 we will proceed, therefore, as follows. We will uh, uh, have a session, uh, a uh, the presentation by Professor Prabhupada Naik, uh, who I'll, I will introduce. Um, then, for about 50 minutes, Excellence Romain will uh, uh, provide her, her comments for another maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer uh, to, until. Our, our, the end of the session, which is uh, uh, two hours long. Um, the uh, we're extremely honored to have with us uh, Professor Habapad Naik uh, to launch this dialogue series. Um, Professor Prabhat took a part of the Agrarian South Network, a collaborator for, since the renowned economist and public intellectual. Uh, uh, he's an emeritus, emeritus professor uh, at the Center of Economic Studies and Planning at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, where he has taught before. Uh, he received his doctoral degree at the University of Oxford in the UK, and thereafter joined the University of Cambridge in 1969, he became one of the youngest faculty members. Uh, in 74, he returned to India, India to join the newly formed Center for Economic Studies and Planning, um, where along with eminent economists like uh, Krishna, Badwaj, Anjal Mukherjee, and Utsa Patik and others, uh, helped to lay the foundations of, a, of the center that was to become uh, what it is today, well known, for producing democratic perspective and studies in economy. Professor Patnaik's contribution to policymaking uh, can be highlighted through his seminal contribution as vice chairman of the Kerala State Planning Board from June 2006 to May 2011. The United Nations as well to recommend reform measures for the global financial system. Um, and is the founder editor of the widely acknowledged journal. Uh, he has written and published uh, widely in popular media. Uh, some of his most important contributions, major books, uh, Lenin and Imperialism in 90, 19, published in 1996, Accumulation and Stability Under Capitalism of Money in 2008, Marxist Capital and Introductory Reader um, uh, Essays 2011, Re Envisioning Socialism, the Theory of Imperialism in 2016, together with uh, Professor Utsa Padnaik, and then a, a new book forthcoming, a sequel to this. Uh, so, um, Professor Padnaik, thank you very much. It's an honor. A great honor for us to have you with us in this uh, first session session of our dialogue. Um, uh, our specific theme today is pandemic shock, economic crisis, and socialist alternatives. Um, hearing uh, what you have to say in this crucial juncture. Thank you. The word is. Thank you. Please unmute your 
Thank you very much, Professor Yeros. Uh, friends and comrades, I feel really grateful, feel highly honored that I have been asked to interact with you today uh, on this subject, pandemic shock, economic crisis, and post-pandemic. When we think of the crisis today, I and mean, obviously there is a very serious economic crisis that is afflicting the entire world, in particular, the entire capitalist world. When we think of the crisis, we typically think in terms of the crisis being caused by the pandemic. But this, that once the pandemic is over, when it is, then good time to be back with us. We would be back to some kind of uh, normal, both in terms of health, as well as in terms of the economy. Now, this, I believe, is a wrong understanding. Very common is a wrong understanding. It's a wrong understanding for at least two reasons. First, the pandemic itself is a kind of shock from which even after the external shock in terms of the health crisis is over, the economic shock lasts a long time. Let me give you an example to show why. In order, suppose the health shock is over, then you would find normal activity resuming, incomes being earned and consumption taking place, even if it is the case that consumption levels go back to where they were before the pandemic struck us again, uh, nonetheless, you would find that the level of activity, the level of capacity utilization would be lower than earlier because of the fact that at that time, some investment was taking place, which would not necessarily be taking place now. Investment would take place only when capacity utilization rises up to a certain point or above a certain point and until that happens, you would find that investment would not take place. And if investment does not take place, then capacity utilization does not get back to its earlier level, remains subdued, remains slow, because of which investment again does not take place. So you'd be caught in this kind of uh, vicious cycle, even after the health shock of the pandemic is over. And that would be because investment occurs only in response to an increase in capacity utilization beyond a certain point, And it will take us a very long time for us to get into that particular state. Therefore, even after the health talk is over, even after consumption activity has resumed, you'd find that the level of capacity utilization and therefore the level of investment would be low. And therefore, the economic shock would continue for a long time. The more important reason, quite apart from this, which is, of course, an uh, obvious technical point, the important reason is that the pandemic-induced crisis is itself ensconced within a deeper crisis, which is structural, which has been afflicting world capitalism for quite some time. Now, that crisis is one which was there even before the pandemic struck us. And that crisis would continue to be there, aggravated by the effect of the pandemic itself, even after the health effect of the pandemic is overcome. Now, this is something which, which would immediately raise the question that, what are you talking about? Because after all, it appears that, let's say, in the world's largest capitalist country, the United States, as Trump never tires of telling us, the level of unemployment today is lower than it has been, or the unemployment rate is lower than it has been over the last 50 years. In other words, it's really as low, 3.5%, as low as you can imagine. So obviously the question would arise that what crisis are you talking about? As a matter of fact, however, if you look at the United States, 
the labor force participation rates have gone down quite seriously compared to, for instance, 2007-2008. If you adjust for the labor force participation rate, then in the United States today, the current unemployment rate, the current adjusted unemployment rate is as high as 8% even though this is not visible because of the dropout of people from the workforce because of the discouraged worker effect. You know, when there's a lot of unemployment, people just drop out of the workforce. They don't even bother to look for jobs because they think that there is no reason, no point in looking for jobs because there are no jobs. So 8% unemployment in the U.S., even before the pandemic struck us. Now, of course, because of the pandemic, it has risen dramatically. It was about 14.7% a month. So, but even if you take that out, nonetheless, the US is in crisis. China and India, newer countries, which were exhibiting very high rates of GDP growth, have themselves been getting into a crisis. And of course, as you know, the demand for primary commodities has fallen sharply, which affects all countries, particularly countries in Africa and Latin America. So that if you look at the level of the primary commodity prices, according to the IMF's All Commodities Index, in December 2019, which is before the pandemic, it is 38% lower than it was in April 2011. So world capitalism has been caught in crisis, which is a structural crisis. And of course, the pandemic has appeared on top of that. And even after the pandemic is over, that structural crisis would go. The question that immediately arises is why is this structural crisis? I believe the structural crisis is a result of the process of neoliberal globalization. What neoliberal globalization has done is that it has really greatly eased, facilitated cross-border movements of commodities and services, and also cross-border movements of capital, including of finance. Now, one aspect of it, which everybody talks about, is that now you have American multinationals investing, let us say, in China to produce for the American market or to produce for the global market. They're investing in Indonesia, in investing in Bangladesh, in India, in Vietnam, and so on. And consequently, you actually have a relocation of manufacturing activities away from the United States or from other advanced capitalist countries to low-wage third world countries, particularly in Asia, for producing the global market. Now, these third world countries have low wages because they have enormous amounts of labor reserves, which themselves were created because of the impact of colonialism, when you actually had domestic de-industrialization, all kinds of domestic activities involving artisan production, craft production, were destroyed because of the import of manufactured goods from the metropolitan countries. But anyway, because of those labor reserves, you actually find that wages are more or less at some kind of subsistence level. They're not, of course, equal across all countries, but nonetheless, they are pretty much at a subsistence level. Therefore, now metropolitan capital is shifting to these locations because of the low wages to produce for the world market. This implies that in the advanced countries themselves, workers are not in a position to enforce higher wages. The trade union movement, even in the United States and other advanced capitalist countries, is really in a state of crisis because of the fact that if you have trade unions becoming active, trade unions becoming militant, then you'd find that capital would immediately relocate to some other convenient location cheaper location. Now, because of this, you find that even the wages of the workers in the advanced capitalist countries get tethered to the wages of the workers in the third world countries. I'm not saying they become equal, but they 
tethered to the wages of the workers in third world countries. They cannot rise. Historically, we found that while wages in India or China, in Indonesia, or in Latin America, remain tied to the subsistence level, wages in the North, in the advanced countries, were rising along with labor productivity. But now you find that that is no longer the case, that effectively the workers in the advanced countries have to compete against the workers in the third world countries. And since the latter are at a subsistence level, the former cannot experience higher and higher and higher wages. Therefore, all over the world, the vector of real wages remains more or less unchanged. But at the same time, you find the vector of labor productivities is increasing everywhere, because of which there is a rise in the share of economic surplus in total world output. And that is the reason for the enormous increase in income inequalities that you observe in the world economy in the period of neoliberal globalization that people like Piketty and others have been talking about. Their explanation is different, but the phenomenon is something that they highlight. Now, if you find, therefore, that the share of economic surplus in output rises, and therefore you find that economic inequalities, income inequalities rise, then this has a depressing effect on the level of aggregate demand. If you shift a dollar from a working man to the surplus earner, then the working man would be more or less consuming the entire dollar, but the surplus earner consumes only a part of it a small part of it keeps the rest for future consumption or what we call savings because of which there is a fall in the overall level of consumption demand. If there's a fall in the overall level of consumption demand, then there's a fall in capacity utilization and therefore investment demand far from making up for it through an increase itself also tends to fall. So you find that there is a tendency towards an ex ante tendency towards overproduction in the world economy. Now, this ex ante tendency would have been visible, would have been, would have brought world capitalism to a crisis, except for the fact that there were two kinds of intervention. Now, of course, we know that this can be overcome through conscious state intervention. When you find that there is a level of uh, potential output that is larger than the demand for it, then the state can always come in and the state can make up for this demand with uh, its own expenditures, which can have to be financed either through a budget deficit, fiscal deficit, or it has to be financed through taxes on the capitalists, again, because the capitalists save a lot of their income. If you tax the capitalists and spend it, then effectively you are taking a part of their savings and spending it, and therefore the state can increase the level of demand. But here I come to the second part of the implications of neoliberal globalization. Namely, that you have now globalization not only of capital flows, but you actually have globalization of financial flows. That now you find that there is an enormous mobility of finance, which is here today, which is uh, in five minutes so with a telephone call, it can be shifted to some other country can be shifted somewhere else. And therefore, you have an enormous globalization of finance. Finance is moving around the world at a dizzying pace. Now, therefore, finance has become globalized. But the states we have are nation states. Effectively, therefore, we have nation states confronting globalized finance. Now, in such a situation, if any nation state pursues any policies which are not liked by globalized finance, which are not the same as those demanded by globalized finance, then finance would simply leave that country and create a massive crisis there, a massive financial crisis. Therefore, all states, whether they like it or not, 
as long as they remain within this orbit of finance, would more or less have to pursue a set of policies which are liked by finance. Now, one reason for, I mean, one, one set of policies that finance does not like is, of course, a fiscal deficit. In fact, one of the reasons why you have fiscal responsibility legislation all over the world all over the world, except United States, you actually have laws limiting the size of the fiscal deficit. You don't have laws limiting, let us say, the or, or, or laws specifying so much should be spent on healthcare. You don't have laws specifying so much should be spent on education. You don't have laws specifying so much should be raised as taxes uh, in the economy. But you do have a law almost in every country, with the exception of the United States, that actually says not more than 3% of the GDP can constitute the fiscal debt. Now, obviously, if the state cannot enlarge the fiscal deficit, if the state cannot tax capitalists, because that too would drive finance away from the country, in that case, the state's hands are, tried, are tied in using fiscal means to inject demand into the economy. Now, the state tries monetary policy, but monetary policy is singularly ineffective. Therefore, you have a situation where the ex-ante tendency towards overproduction in the world economy could not be systematically countered by state intervention, but on the contrary, it is something which was kept in check temporarily by asset price bubbles. You had in the late 90s, the dot-com bubble, the dot-com companies in the United States, they, their asset prices increased dramatically. And when the dot-com bubble collapsed, you had the housing bubble earlier part of this century, because of which when you have these bubbles, then these bubbles generate an artificial feeling of wealthiness, which is why then people who feel wealthier tend to spend more, and therefore there is an artificial boost to demand that is generated. But of course, with the collapse of the bubble, you find that the boost to demand itself uh, is something which is uh, which disappears. So you had asset price bubbles which are characteristic of this period of neoliberal globalization, which had kept in check the tendency towards overproduction that would be, that would have been there, the ex ante tendency towards overproduction arising from the rise in the share of the economic service. Now the point is that with the collapse of the housing bubble, there has been a slowing down a visible, a, a visible overproduction crisis in the world economy. And on top of that visible over, overproduction crisis, you have the impact of the pandemic. So we are in the midst of a situation where the pandemic has come in the midst of a structural crisis. Now, this is something which is not just being said by me. In fact, many bourgeois writers, those who are a little smarter than the average bourgeois ideologues, have also been saying this. In Britain, for instance, the Financial Times has been having lots of editorials in which it has been arguing that, look, the world economy today is in a sort of Keynes-Roosevelt moment. Like in the 1930s, if you remember, in the midst of the Great Depression, Franklin Roosevelt had introduced the so-called New Deal, which basically meant that the state had intervened to boost demand. Now is the need for such an intervention by the state all over the, um, all over the capitalist world. That, that such interventions are from being against capitalism are in fact required now to save capitalism from the kind of crisis in which it is caught.
Now, this is something which has been said, as I said, by many people who belong uh, to basically the bourgeois establishment. In fact, the financial establishment itself, even though this is not the position of finance capital, it's not surprising that, as a matter of fact, even the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, said the other day that he would like to introduce a new deal, like Roosevelt had done in the 1930s, and he would like to raise taxes on the rich for financing this new deal. And he prefaced this entire, and, and he, would, he would like to expand public investment. And he prefaced this entire speech by saying, believe me, I'm not a communist. In other words, he was aware that these kinds of, 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 of solutions would have been branded as being communist solutions, but a few months, but a couple of years ago. But it is the depth of the crisis of neoliberal globalization, because of which now these solutions are back again on the agenda. Now, I believe that here we must distinguish between the understanding, between, between the, the, the intellectual climate in the North on the one hand and in the South on the other. In the North, as I said, while many people, they, they, they obviously the bulk of the people, uh, bulk of the bourgeoisie believes that, that this is only a pandemic caused crisis. Once the pandemic is over, things will be back to normal. It is not so. And this is something which is even understood by certain segments of the bourgeoisie. But on the other hand, these segments of the bourgeoisie who would actually like to have state intervention to overcome the crisis of capitalism, they tend to underestimate the opposition of finance to state intervention. I think we should be clear why finance opposes state intervention. The reason it does so is because if you have direct state intervention, for instance, through building up public investment to overcome the effects of the crisis, then that undermines the legitimacy of the capitalists. Then the question would naturally arise that if we can have a public sector that does the job, if we can have public investment, if we need the state to intervene to get out of the crisis, why do we need the capitalists? Therefore, they have an instinctive reaction against state intervention, which is why you may have noticed that during the neoliberal globalization, there was a massive ideological attack on the public sector, an ideological attack which, which vilified the public sector, which actually presented the public sector as the villain, because the whole idea was to show that the state cannot do all this. You require us, the capitalists, to run the capitalist economy. Therefore, finance has been, is, and will be totally opposed to any state intervention, which, by the way, is why finance was also opposed to Roosevelt's New Deal. In, in fact, when the New Deal was introduced, within a year of it, unemployment had fallen. But on the other hand, the argument was used that since unemployment has fallen, all right, now let's withdraw from all these fiscal deficits and so on. And therefore, America took a step backwards because of which, again, in 1937, there was a recession. And ultimately, America and the rest of the capitalist world came out of the crisis because of the Second World War, because of the armaments expenditure, arms and military expenditure undertaken for the Second World War. Similarly, when Keynes wrote his general theory, nobody bothered about it. In his own country, Britain, it was completely ignored. But on the other hand, it is only in the post-war period when you had a change in the balance of class forces in the advanced countries with labor, the working class becoming powerful after the Second World War, a symptom of which was Winston Churchill losing the elections in Britain, a symptom of which was the communists becoming coalition partners in France and in Italy because of the fact that the working class had emerged much stronger from the war 
much more militant. They didn't want to go back to the days of the depression and so on of the, of the 1930s. Because of that, capitalism was forced to introduce some of these changes and to overcome the opposition of finance. And this was easier done because finance that time was not globalized finance. British working class, British labor government could actually overcome the opposition of British finance capital, just as the US government could overcome the opposition of US finance capital. Finance was not globalized. You had finance, which was nation-based and typically confined more or less to the, I mean, you know, it was aided by the nation state and therefore it was amenable to control by the nation state if a government happened to come, which relied on the uh, support of, of the working class. Therefore, there would be, even though many people in the advanced countries, including bourgeois spokesmen, see the need for state intervention, finance is going to oppose it. To overcome this opposition, you would in fact require the mobilization of the working class, you would in fact require struggle by the working class. Class struggle is required to overcome the opposition of finance to the kind of uh, state intervention. And that would also entail putting capital controls, ensuring that finance does not flee the country, preventing it from fleeing the country, introducing restrictions on its outward flows and therefore also the, being prepared that it would not flow into your own country. So you'll have to have capital controls of various kinds. And this is something which therefore would require a kind of intensification of class struggle. And that a Tory government, a conservative government, Boris Johnson's government cannot do, that even a moderate Labour government cannot do, that requires the ascendancy of the left. And when you have class struggle of that kind, giving rise to the ascendancy of the left, and that is something which is not necessarily going to remain confined to capitalism itself, that would then move on beyond capitalism towards a newer mode of production. Or it can move on, and obviously, it all depends on the outcome of the class struggle, but it can move on towards a newer mode of production. In other words, in the advanced capitalist countries, getting out of the crisis itself would require steps, would require a kind of class mobilization, which open up the way for the economy to move beyond capitalism. Then it, 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 it is something where nobody can guarantee that is going to remain within the confines of capitalism. I now come to the case of the third world countries, of the South. Now, in the South, you find a, some very different intellectual climate, a very different discourse that is taking. In the South, nobody, I mean, in, in, in many countries of the South, most countries of the South, there's India, Brazil, and so on, you find that the, con the governments which are in power are governments which are not talking about stepping out of neoliberal globalization, of actually increasing the autonomy of the state, using that autonomy of the state to inject demand into the economy in order to overcome the crisis. On the contrary, they are still stuck in promoting the strategy of neoliberalism. They are still stuck in actually ensuring that they remain within the neoliberal globalization paradigm. Within that, they attack labor rights they attack the workers, they attack democratic rights, and they believe that by doing so, they would be become attractive as locations for investment, and this in turn would actually get them out of the crisis. In other words, they are thinking not in terms of changing the paradigm even to the slightest extent, 
they are thinking in terms of actually within that paradigm itself trying to get out of the crisis. Now, this is something which they are told has spawned a lot of fascist, semi-fascist governments in many countries of the South. I know that in India or in Brazil and so on, the kind of government, Turkey, the kind of governments you have are governments which are either fascist or neo-fascist or, or, or quasi-fascist and so on, which are actually currently engaged in attacking the rights of labor, in attacking democratic rights, in, att in attacking human rights, in attacking the right to dissent and so on. In India, for instance, if you criticize the government, then you are put in jail on charges of sedition and under all kinds of stringent laws as in engaging in anti-national activity. And, and, and similarly in India now, there is a real attack on labor rights. For instance, uh, the idea is to make uh, the labor market flexible, which is just a euphemism for ensuring that workers can be fired at will. And that they believe is something which will attract, make the country attractive from the point of view of uh, multinational capital, therefore would bring in investment and therefore would try and overcome the crisis. Now this, is something which is a fundamentally erroneous strategy. In fact, likewise, they give tax concessions to the corporate sector. It's a fundamentally erroneous strategy. It's not going to overcome any crisis for a very simple reason. Imagine if you are giving tax concessions to the capitalists, effectively then, suppose you give $100 to the capitalists, then the government's budget deficit would increase. If it increases, then the government would either have to cut back its own expenditures or to raise these resources at the expense of the working people, peasants and workers. Effectively, therefore, you have shifted income distribution from peasants and workers to the capitalists, made it much more unequal. And since this inequality was the origin of the crisis anyway, further accentuating these inequalities, which will actually accentuate the crisis. Similarly, if this is done by curtailing public investment or public expenditure, then effectively $100 of ex government expenditure are being cut. But on the other hand, the $100 you hand over to the capitalists, they're not going to spend all of it immediately. So there would be a reduction in demand. The crisis would become worse. Similarly, think in terms of the attack on labor rights that is taking place. If you attack labor rights, then this attack on labor rights ultimately means that trade unions become even more impossible to, to, to function. Therefore, the bargaining strength of the workers suffers. Therefore, there is again a further shift from wages to surplus or wages to profits. And therefore, that further accentuates the crisis. And this business of this being able to attract investment, the whole idea of the global crisis is that very little investment is taking place anyway. When very little investment is taking place anyway, and you find that several third world countries are vying with one another to attract that investment, no single country would actually succeed in attracting, attracting any larger investment by pursuing these policies. Basically, it would be a race to the bottom among these countries uh, in terms of the attack on democracy and on labor rights. Now, as you find that these policies, which are the favorite policies of the fascist, neo-fascist governments that are coming into being in a lot of third world countries, or have come into being, uh, all of them enjoy the backing of finance capital, of globalized finance. All of them are financed by the corporate financial oligarchy, which itself is closely linked to globalized finance. And they would they finance these governments in order to bring about a discourse shift where the attack on them is something which is forestalled. 
for instance, if somebody is unemployed, then you say, oh, you're unemployed, not because of the system, not because of any such thing. You're unemployed because that immigrant is stealing your job. You're unemployed because that Muslim is stealing your job. You're unemployed because that, that, that some other ethnic person is stealing your job. The other is blamed for your status. And this discourse shift is something which is facilitated by these fascist groups, or by the fascist governments coming to power. Even when there are no fascist governments, the fascist groups exist in these countries. And they actually also get a stimulus because of the backing they receive from globalized finance for bringing about this kind of a discourse. And when they are in government, they of course pursue these, these policies that are infructuous, these policies that don't work, and therefore they actually further intensify the fascist attacks on the people. Therefore, in the South, we are not coming across many governments which are actually thinking in terms of introducing a new deal in terms of enlarging public investment, in terms of enlarging welfare expenditures, in terms of enlarging expenditures on education and health, but rather are thinking in terms of austerity, but thinking remaining within the paradigm of neoliberal globalization and in the process trying to create conditions where the capitalists would be enthused to undertake larger investment because of the attack on workers and because of income distribution. If in their favor. Now, in this kind of a situation, therefore, as the attack on the people increases, in the South, you would find a different kind of trajectory. You would find, for instance, people defending, coming together to defend their democratic rights, coming together in a struggle against fascism, coming together in a struggle against the abridgment of democracy and, 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 and freedom and so on. So it will have to be a political struggle for establishing democracy. And that political struggle, of course, when it comes, when it becomes successful, that political struggle would have to have an alternative economic strategy. And that alternative economic strategy would once again have to be an economic strategy that looks upon state intervention through public investment, through public welfare expenditures and so on as a way of getting out of the crisis, because of which again capital control would have to be introduced, because of which again you would have to have a delinking of the South, of economies of the South from neoliberal globalization. And when that happens, then these forces too cannot really remain confined to the capitalist phase alone because much of the bourgeoisie, much of their big bourgeoisie is already gone over, is a part of globalized finance capital and consequently an attack on globalized finance capital, an attack on the hegemony of globalized finance capital would have to be an attack on the bourgeoisie itself. And when that happens, then you would have to, through in stages, have to have a gradual movement towards an alternative society and an alternative economy, transcending capitalism. Therefore, whether we are looking at the North or whether we are looking at the South, it seems to me that we are on the cusp of a change. This change is a change that can actually carry mankind beyond capitalism itself, or if I may look at it differently, neoliberal capitalism has reached a dead end. In this dead end, neoliberal capitalism does not have any clear ideas of where to go forward within the capitalist uh, uh, ambience itself. In, in other words, what you see, think of the 1930s. In the 1930s, when the world was in the midst of the Great Depression, 
already many people like John Maynard Keynes, for instance, were saying that, listen, it's very important that we actually preserve capitalism by having the state to come in and stabilize it. In other words, against the laissez-faire capitalism that actually, by laissez-faire, I mean only in terms of state policy, uh, not free competition, but laissez-faire capitalism that actually had existed till then and till then and brought capitalism to the crisis. There was already a vision of a capitalism that is possible beyond that phase in which the state would play a role and so on, and, 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 and the, that would be of a managed capitalism. Today, we are in a situation where, again, neoliberal capitalism is in a crisis, but there is no such vision. There is no conception of how capitalism can overcome this crisis and go beyond the neoliberal capitalism that is characterized by the hegemony of globalized finance. It is because of this that actually now uh, it becomes open for any strategy to get out of the crisis, crisis affects the people, any mobilization of the people to get out of the crisis, to actually go beyond capitalism. That really speaking, if you like, any such crisis where there would be different people trying to find solutions for the crisis, uh, uh, you know, in different ways. For instance, there's a very interesting article by Keynes where he talks about the fact that, that you know, the Bolsheviks are trying to find a solution to the crisis of capitalism that is different from the solution that he would advance. The Bolshevik solution is what he called state socialism, while his solution was for a socialization of investment, that you don't need socialization, the means of production. So, so in a situation of crisis, when there are alternative perception of how to move forward, what I'm suggesting is that the bourgeois perception of how to move forward that has been advanced until now is one which does not have any takers. And it would entail a, 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 a struggle against the hegemony of finance. And on the other hand, if the working class, which is going to do the struggle in the advanced countries against the hegemony of finance, which is going to do the struggle in the South against the fascist abridgment of democratic rights, if the working class is clear about its goals, objectives, and if it can therefore lead on towards socialism. It's a real historic possibility. We are on the cusp of this historic possibility and we have to grasp this opportunity. I think I should stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Patnaik, uh, for this uh, illuminating talk. Um, which touched on uh, so many uh, of the fundamental questions that are presented to us today. Um, I will um, refrain from making my own, uh, all the questions that have come to my mind, and I will quickly, but I will hopefully uh, pitch in at the end. I will um, go directly before um, opening up for questions, I will go directly to uh, Dr. Lino Somme, who will uh, provide some comments um, and discuss your your your, your presentation uh, next. Uh, the just to remind our our um, our audience uh, who may have joined us after the beginning of the session, uh, this is the first of a series of online uh, dialogues uh, organized by the Grand South Network together with the Samoyo African Institute for Agrarian Studies in Zimbabwe, Harare, in Harare, Zimbabwe, and our and the um, uh, Action Aid Association in, in India. Uh, we have uh, over a hundred uh, participants today who have been with us from the beginning uh, from uh, all across the world, north and south, east and west, uh, in a truly global um, if, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, um, write them in the chat section here on Zoom. 
or uh, on our Facebook uh, page, uh, session is being live streamed. Okay. Lynn, uh, Dr. Lynn Norman is a research, uh, a senior research fellow at the Macquarie Institute of Social Research at Macquarie University, where she teaches mm -hmm. politics and uh, feminist political economy. Uh, she's author most recently of uh, the book entitled Gender, Ethnicity and Violence in Kenya's Transitions to Democracy. Um, and is co-editor of the forthcoming volume entitled Labor Questions in the Global South, which is one of our tricontinental um, research uh, collaborations. Uh, Lynn Osome is uh, associate editor of Agrarian South, our journal, co-editor of the Journal of Contemporary African Studies, serves on several boards, among them the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, uh, Codestria, and the International Association for Feminist Economics. Lynn is a long-term member of the Agrarian South Network, also um, a, an organic uh, member of this network from uh, the beginning. Lynn, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, the mic is yours. Thank you. Am I? Okay. Thank you, Paris, and uh, thank you, Professor Patnai, for, for your lecture. So I have a couple of comments which I've tried to organize thematically around three broad uh, issues, which I think uh, uh, recur in your work. So first is around uh, COVID-19 and, and the crisis of neoliberalism. So, and you've, you've already uh, spoken about this at length and you'll forgive me if I'm uh, repeating some of the things you said, but we are faced in this moment with the tension between a global pandemic, you know, globalization, and uh, or due to globalization and the nation state. And you, 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 you do speak about this uh, quite a bit in your own work. And, and also we are also faced with the fact that the pandemic responses, for example, the vaccine, you know, what, what we are thinking about in terms of its treatment and the vaccination is, is likely to act as a, a kind of a, a Trojan horse for the reassertion of imperialist domination. So we might see the cooptation of third world countries into responses that mimic advanced capitalist states and of course exclude the poor. So my question is, is what options exist at this moment for third world countries, if at all? And, and of course you have dealt with the notion of delinking. Uh, you know, can we think uh, of what happens in, the, in, in this moment and in the post-pandemic world, to, uh, thinking through the, this notion of delinking. You, you know, you view it as a necessary part, albeit you also highlight that there are certain conditions uh, and it, it, under which, or which constrain it in relation to the third world, and it is subject to certain limitations. So how, how do you, uh, in your thinking, how are the conditions of delinking likely to be modified, if at all, we, we might think of this in a post-pandemic world or by the pandemic? And, and you know, a second point in relation to this question of the crisis of neoliberalism, you know, especially considering the extent to which neoliberal globalization has weakened the nation, the national and the popular basis on which uh, the linking depends. So, you know, if you're thinking of a post-capitalist world or in our socialist vision, we are of course concerned with, with uh, the question both of national sovereignty and internationalist solidarity. And there have been, I think, some tendency to, to see this as opposed when we are thinking of delinking, but you've shown clearly in your work that they are not opposed. So do you think that the 
different responses to this pandemic uh, can modify the way in which we are thinking about some of the problems that are associated with delinking. You have identified some of the problems uh, with delinking in your own work. So um, is there an opportunity here in a, in, in a more concrete sense? Uh, if you could point us to, to one or two. And a second thematic question I want to, or, or, or thematic framing I want to deal with is the agrarian South and the socialist path. So, you know, when we look at the recent trends in how this pandemic has unfolded, uh, one of the things, at least for me or from my vantage point that it has highlighted is the significance of agriculture. And I, I did read a statement by uh, a, a group of Indian economists, and I believe you're one of the people who, 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 who wrote this statement earlier on was around how agriculture, you know, its significance again is being reasserted, right? So, so this, this pandemic has highlighted the significance, you know, in, in a sense reflecting the relevance of the peasant path, which in the agrarian south network we have been uh, very consistently talking about. So in India, for example, we've seen this massive migration. I don't know if you could call it a forced migration to, uh, to, to the rural areas at when the lockdown was implemented. In Kenya, uh, you know, the, uh, even during the lockdown, the transport companies, the bus companies turned into, into parcel delivery services. And a lot of what was being delivered was food from rural uh, families to urban families. So much of urban survival during the lockdown in Kenya depended on this uh, supply of food from the rural to the urban. In Uganda also, it was very clear that rural, it was rural food production that was sustaining the lockdown, both politically and socially. You know, so even when uh, there was a total lockdown, the markets remained open. So women were told you could go and sell in the market, but you're kind of quarantined in there. Uh, and, and of course, they were being supplied by, by, the, by rural produce. So the, the, the person part, as we know, articulates not just an economic, but also importantly, a political question for the global South. You know, in relation to the agrarian question. Uh, and so they, I think that there is a firm basis, this, you know, based on what I'm describing, upon which much of the agrarian South can focus a post COVID narrative on, say, radical land reform, radical land redistribution and reforms. But my question is, and maybe it's too early to ask this question, why are we not seeing this discussion specifically on land, on land redistribution? There's an acknowledgement of food, and of course, you know, implicit there, you're talking about land, but why are we not seeing um, uh, an overt, uh, you know, discussion, a specific discussion on land redistribution uh, being firmly placed on the table. And, and still, still on, on the question of land. Um, so feminist agrarian scholars have been dealing with you know, the question of social reproduction and gendered labor as an agrarian question. I mean, social reproduction is something everyone's talking about now. Uh, and, and social reproduction, as we know, does take place whether or not people are employed. Uh, and it, you know, it's, depend, it's dependent on different factors in different historical and social contexts. So whereas access to land might be central to social reproduction in some places, you know, in the agrarian South it is, in other places, uh, you know, employment guarantee schemes, uh, as what we have seen, what has happened in India, and cash transfers or universal basic income 
or other forms of welfare might matter more than, than land. But of course, many of these things are also articulated still to land. Uh, so in the agrarian South, land gains particular centrality because uh, activities of, of semi-proletarianized households, you know, when, whether you're thinking of wage labor or, or um, petty commodity production or peasant agriculture, uh, which, which now we see happening in combination, right? And so all of these depend to some extent on access to land. So land in a sense is central to the survival of, of peasant and, and working class household. But so but here is my problem or my question. The, the, you know, the politics of survival somehow falls outside of the purview of exploitation. And, and therefore outside of the domain of class struggle. So we have all these people who are depending on land and whose survival depends on land, but are not accounted for. So it's the old peasant question, I guess, that, that uh, we are seeing uh, reasserting itself in a different way under neoliberalism because of all these, this labor that is, is being expended and mass by capitalism. So, so it has become increasingly easy, even among progressives, uh, to see poor people as you know, just surplus and their land claims articulated to survival and not to development. So you know, when we're thinking of, you know, in, in, of a socialist path, do we risk losing the political fight around land? Is, is that, you know, are we head, heading there? Especially, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that we are so reduced to a sort of, uh, you know, we are at the minimum level of demands on which the, the, the people can place on the state. Um, and, and thirdly, in relation to this, uh, the agrarian, the agrarian South, and the socialist path, um, it is possible you know, also to see within this pandemic, of course, as with, uh, with every systemic crisis of capitalism in history, we have seen, you know, we see the intensification of the contradictions that are necessary to shift capitalism, right? Into a different, an advanced stage. So, for example, you have pointed out the contradiction between the dictates of finance and the interests of the people, which, which in, in this period has become ab absolutely acute. So, the question of redistribution uh, and welfare is again being posed to the neoliberal state. So, so, in a sense, there are things that we should, we can celebrate about this. Or we should, that should be celebrated about this pandemic, if only just giving rise to this, this old questions that were not settled but were buried. But even so, I mean, recent history tells us that the concessions may only be short-lived, um, and, and capital is likely to, you know, kind of auto-correct in its own favor. So. My question to you, or something I'd like you to reflect on, is what sorts of actions or activity can we, you know, who are invested in, in a socialist path, undertake to sustain or to prolong this period of concession of state intervention? Uh, and, and, and to do so, of course, without losing the kinds of structural transformations that might be possible. And lastly, I want to speak about the idea of freedom and the crisis of the neoliberal state. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm very glad to see that you, you, you use this idea in your work, not in the bourgeois sense of freedom, but I think it's something that we need to think of critically, especially if you're thinking of a different form of, of, of a different type of world. 
So on the question of redistribution of wealth and income, uh, you know, we know of neoliberal globalizations, you know, it's imminent tendency to concentrate wealth in, the, in favor of uh, a tiny minority. Uh, in, in your own work, you actually point this partly at least uh, to a crisis of the nation state itself. You know, you talk of it as the limited scope that the nation state has for political intervention. So, you know, in a, in a sense, the weakening of the, of the political uh, intervention as a redistributive weapon. So COVID-19 is, I think, again, exposing this, this weakness, especially, again, when we think of the vaccine trials and the varied, res the, the varied responses that different countries have. Uh, redistribution and, and welfare are in a sense being disarticulated from the political agenda, right? So they are being depoliticized by those who oppose state intervention. Um, and, and yet we understand this pandemic not just as an economic crisis, but also a political crisis. I think we have to. Uh, especially if we are thinking of a, trans, a trans, transformative agenda, we have to think of it politically. And I think that has been there in many of the critiques. So my question to you is, um, in what ways can we so, sort of strengthen our political claims to the state? In, in other words, is it possible to have state intervention uh, I mean, it is possible, it, 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 and you, you mentioned this in your talk just now, that you know, the state can intervene, but ideologically is still driven by the old thinking, right? So is it too far-fetched for us to imagine that the models of redistribution and welfare that are being implemented in certain countries at least might change the direction of the state? And also in, in, in your work, in this relation, especially when you, you're talking about democracy, you, you have shown, you know, you make a link between democracy and freedom and, you know, increase in, in, uh, in wealth, uh, wealth, you know, inequality, you know, how increases in wealth uh, and income inequality might interfere with democracy and freedom. And we might add violence, uh, you know, the attachment of, of violence to democracy. And I'm speaking about the, the very particular form of liberal democracy, which I think is an inherently violent political system, right? So you, you talk about this link, which you see as an enduring phenomenon under globalization. But I'm um, I'm also thinking of this link in particular relation to the ways in which, again, land and subsistence agriculture, and I mean particularly food security, uh, play an important role in, in political stabilization of nation states. Uh, you know, the, the link between food security and violence is, is not restricted, it's not only democracy that can guarantee the, stabi the stability of a state um, on, on the basis of food. Uh, even authoritarian regimes, regimes can achieve this. We've seen this in Uganda. From the colonial period to the, um, to the Obote regime, to Idi Amin, to even now the current uh, government, Museveni, all of these successive regimes have, have attempted to settle the food question in favor of the peasantry. And of course, these are regimes that have been characterized as authoritarian. So in this regard, you know, I'm thinking of um, the question of democracy. And I mean, I absolutely believe that it has to remain within our purview you know, in a, on a socialist path. But should democracy be our point of departure 
or you know should we focus on uh, should we not focus on putting in place uh, redistributive or welfare provisions around uh, food and water and land as a precondition so regardless of the substantive form of the state in a sense I'm wondering about the socialist path and whether the focus on the state itself, on reforming the state is not a distraction. Especially when you consider that sovereignty, you know, the notion of sovereignty and you know, uh, itself is, is actually now more concretely located in the political economy. That's what neoliberalism, neoliberal globalization have done. That sovereignty is, in, is not, no longer in the nation state and is in the political economy. So, uh, I think it's a roundabout way of asking what would we, are we putting the, I mean, where should our focus be in terms of these uh, struggles to reform or reconstitute the state? And the last point, the last uh, um, issue at home I'd like to reflect on is the idea of freedom, which which, uh, which you, in, in your thinking, you think of freedom as a lack of constraint upon praxis, right? So for improving living conditions and so on. Uh, and you, so you're thinking of it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting on it as a political question in a materialist sense, or even, but even also existentially. But I'm, I'm specifically reflecting on freedom in its articulation with power. You know, the, the idea that we cannot think of freedom without thinking of power. And in a, in, in a socialist uh, world, this power rests with the people, right? But at the same time, now in this world we are, we are, we are speaking within, um, we, are, we are speaking of people you know, reserve labor, oppressed people who have been so disempowered and whose humanity is routinely disavowed and who have been utterly deprived of dignity over a very long period of time. You know, to the extent that capitalism has made it impossible for, for, the, for a good uh, majority in, in the world, especially the third world, to imagine freedom let alone democracy in a substantive sense. So could you share your thoughts on how you think a socialist vision of democracy transforms the idea of, of uh, freedom for the oppressed? I'll stop there. You also covered uh, and uh, so much to thank you for today. We um, have uh, 40 minutes. Uh, I said that um, uh, I suggest that uh, Professor Patnaik responds to Lynn's questions first, and then uh, maybe in uh, within 15 minutes. Uh, and then we can open a series of questions that are coming up through our chat group uh, and on Facebook, uh, which we would, uh, which I'm organizing here. We can put to you in a, in a summarized form uh, for the uh, last leg of this uh, session. So um, uh, just to remind our, our, our uh, public that uh, this is a, a our first session of our online dialogue series so organized by Agrarian South Network. And we have we have with us uh, Professor Prabhat Padnaik, eminent uh, Marxist economist, and uh, Dr. Lino Somme, uh, uh, who is a, a feminist political, political economist at uh, Makerere in Uganda. So Professor Padnaik, please. Thank the you. microphone is yours. Thank you. Uh, you know, you raised a number of very basic fundamental questions. I may not be able to answer all of them satisfactorily or even answer all of them at all. Uh, but let me just 
pick up a few important ones. Firstly, the question about imperialism. I see neoliberal globalization itself as an imperialist assertion. In other words, I believe that we are now living in a world where there is imperialism of globalized finance. And a neoliberal globalization is in fact the expression of that imperialism. Therefore, I see anti-imperialist struggle as taking the form of the recapturing of the autonomy and sovereignty of the nation state vis-a-vis -vis globalized finance. But in this struggle, much of the big bourgeoisie domestically is actually aligned with, 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 with globalized finance. And therefore, the nation state that is going to be asserting itself would have to be a nation state which is sustained by the support of the peasants and the workers and the fishermen and the craftsmen and the petty producers and so on. So it will have to be, I mean, in other words, the difference between the anti-colonial struggle and now is that in the anti-colonial struggle, the bourgeoisie was in, in okay, apart from some comfortor elements, was in fact on the side of the people. It struggled against imperialism. But on the other hand, now the division, the divide is within that block itself where the bourgeoisie is now aligned with globalized finance and the assertion of the nation state, the recapturing of the national sovereignty is something which has to be done by the people because unless they capture the state which reasserts the sovereignty, an alternative policy is just not possible to the neoliberal one. Uh, the second point which you raised was about land. Yes, I, I think land is very important, but I would like to draw a distinction between you see, again, the land question earlier and the land question now. I think the, the, the impact of neoliberal globalization has been felt most on peasant agriculture, on the petty producers, on the fishermen, craftsmen, and so on. In, in, in other words, I mean, that's why you have numerous suicides of the peasants. During the dirigist period, during the period of immediate post-decolonization, in many countries of the South, the government actually came to support peasant agriculturists. Because under the colonial period, they had been attacked, they had been taxed, they had been looted and so on. But now what you find is the government is not supporting them. As, as, as a result, they are being left open, which is... Even in Uganda, you know, kind of, uh, you find, for instance, multinational seeds are coming in for which they charge very high prices and so on. You know, in other words, the, the peasant agriculture becomes a domain for the domination of agribusiness, of, of, of multinational agriculture. So, so, to my mind, the peasantry has to be mobilized above all against the uh, against the hegemony of globalized finance and of multinational capital that is aligned to globalized finance. Yes, of course, the land question is extremely important, but the land question has to be tackled to the extent that the land, I mean, for instance, in Africa, the land question is a question of land grab that is done by all kinds of people, by Indians and, 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 and people going in and grabbing land. I think that can be attacked together with the attack on neoliberal globalization. But if it is a question of land question that entails the redistribution of land within the peasantry, I think that is a matter which has to be postponed because I think keeping the unity of the working class and the peasantry, peasant agriculture, peasantry, petty producers and so on, is very important in the struggle against it. Uh, then you raise the question of um, Food security, yes. I think food security is vital. In fact, even in India, you know, I mean, these millions of migrant workers, they went back to the villages. And the reason why the country survives today 
is because it had 77 million tons of food grain stocks which it inherited. And in addition, it has mobilized from the new crop and so on. So, so, so in a sense, when everything else is over, when all other employment opportunities are over, when all other activities are closed, what actually sustains the country, what sustains the society is the fact that it produces enough food grain. There are enough food grains available. Otherwise, there would be mayhem. There would be a real kind of famine-like condition prevailing. I mean, some of it is, is probably already uh, on the doorstep. But on the other hand, we have not yet descended to that. So food security is vital. And again, imperialism undermines food security in the third world. It actually makes third world countries produce cash crops and export crops that it wants and to become dependent upon them for food imports. This happened in Africa some time ago. This is something which I've been trying in India for a very long time, except that no government in India would have the courage to push peasant agriculture into uh, abandoning food crop production and going in for cash crop production. So, so one of the agendas of imperialism is to actually make third world agriculture cater to its requirements. And then they don't require food. They require all kinds. I mean, they, they don't require necessarily the food crops we grow, but they require all kinds of other things. They require fibers. They require beverages. They require um, the fruits. They require vegetables and so on, as far as agriculture is concerned. So making third world agriculture cater to the demands of imperialism and thereby abandon its Commitment to food security, national food security, is something which is an object of imperialism, and therefore emphasizing food security is very important. Uh, then you raise the question of okay, na national sovereignty. I just want to make a very brief comment. You know that 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 there is much talk these days, particularly in my view, in northern cir left circles, including even northern Marxist circles that delinking from globalization is a nationalist project, which therefore is in some sense reactionary. Nationalism is taken to be synonymous with reaction. Now, this is something which I do not uh, accept because I believe we have to distinguish between nationalism and nationalism. Mandela's nationalism is not the same as Hitler's nationalism. Anti-colonial nationalism is not the same as aggressive imperialist nationalism. In fact, the anti-colonial nationalist project was a unique project. Nothing of this kind had ever happened in world history. Nationalism, formation of nations in Europe, was associated with an imperial project. Within, 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 you know, within weeks or months of coming into, you know, I mean, the, the Westphalian peace treaties, which began in the 17th century, which began the national project in Europe, you actually had Cromwell marching into Ireland, which was the first colony. And you had those countries becoming nations fighting all over the world in order to have their own little empires and so on. So that's an imperialist nationalism, while we have to uh, think in terms of the nationalism that is anti-imperialism. And, 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 and I believe delinking from globalization is an essential part of that anti-imperialist nationalism. And then, then there was a question of, you know, what is the agenda of delinking? I deliberately did not go into the agenda of delinking too much because that would, of course, vary from country to country and, 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 and so on. But on the other hand, this is something which, which essentially would mean the coming into being of a state of workers, peasants, and, and the working people, what Lenin had called the working people. That means, I mean, he had talked to the Soviets of the working people. Therefore, I'm thinking in terms of a state of the working people that would carry through an anti-imperialist, and therefore, in our context, an anti-big capital agenda. That agenda would, of course, have to emphasize the growth of the home market. Now, home market in our situation essentially means promoting peasant agriculture. Because, you know, if you're not relying on an export market, then the domestic, and it would not only mean uh, uh, emphasizing the growth of peasant agriculture, it would also mean a more egalitarian distribution of wealth and incomes. 
obviously, because then the market would be much larger. And consequently, a number of steps have to be taken towards that. For instance, I talked about public investment. Public investment, rather than the government giving tax concessions to capitalists. How is public investment to be financed? Public investment has to be financed, in my view, through a taxation of wealth, through, you know, in India, for instance, and I imagine that's the true of most of the third world, there is hardly any wealth taxation. There's hardly any inheritance taxation. And, 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 and that is something which even bourgeois ideology cannot defend. The bourgeois ideology says that a capitalist deserves his wealth because he's talented, he has got innovativeness, he has got risk-taking ability and so on. But his children don't have. His children have to demonstrate the innovativeness. Therefore, inheritance taxation, wealth taxation is absolutely essential for financing public investment. And that's the kind of thing that I, that I expect the state to do, which is based on the support of workers and peasants, and which is delinking from imperialist globalization. Uh, the last point which you raised, which is very deep and profound, is to do with issues of democracy and freedom and so on. Now, I think. Socialism essentially consists in empowering the people. By the way, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't, you see, I don't, I don't think of a Chinese wall between bourgeois democracy and socialist democracy. I believe socialism is a deepening of democracy to a point where people are empowered. You know, the bourgeois democracy, actually, the so-called bourgeois democracy, actually puts constraints on democracy. It does not allow democracy to be as democratic as we would like it to be. Therefore, it is not that we, it is not that we, it is not that we move away from bourgeois democracy. We want to deepen bourgeois democracy. We want to make sure that bourgeois democracy goes beyond its bourgeois bounds. And, and, and that is the way that, that I value democracy. At the moment, by the way, because we have a fascist government, I mean, this, 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 this demand for having even bourgeois democracy has become very important. But, but the demand for bourgeois democracy is one that has to be carried further and further beyond its bourgeois limits and bounds. And uh, much the same, I would, I would say about freedom. You know, that that you say that you said quite rightly that our people have been so subject to, so viciously subject to imperialist exploitation, imperialist terrorization, and 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 so on. That really the notion of, I mean, that that they have to fight for their freedom, and the notion of freedom appears a distant notion compared to the notion of, let's say, land, food, and all that. I agree, of course. But on the other hand, I believe that the fight for freedom is essential to the struggle for socialism. Let me be very frank. I do not value very greatly a socialist project whose objective is to put a one-party dictatorship in power. In other words, I I would support I would support that socialism against a bourgeois society, but that, to my mind, is not the vision of socialism. So, so I, think I better stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so the fundamental points were actually uh, elucidated. Uh, quite clearly, in uh, in a few minutes that you that you uh, dedicated to <laughs> to some some of the questions that uh, Lynn has uh, put forth have appeared in uh, some way in uh, the the in the chat group that we have here. Um, so we will proceed with with these questions. Uh, I will um, uh, try to bond together. Uh, because some actually converge quite well, yeah. and um, there is one. Of course, there's a, a a group of questions that are about India, yeah, um, and I suggest we leave that for the end, okay? Um, because I think uh, um, much to say on this issue. So let's just leave the, put a bracket around that and come back to it. Basically, that question I will just put it. Uh, given the BJP policy 
uh, of uh, polarizing uh, the nation around um, caste, uh, mobilizing all kinds of discourses around religion, uh, gender, um, and uh, creating this unity. Yeah? How can unity be achieved again? So that's one, uh, and what are the limitations of, of these types of cleavages in the um, religion? Uh, what are the limits of these cleavages for the position that you are uh, proposing? Uh, there is, related to this question on India, uh, is the question of, of labor laws, uh, which are being uh, suppressed. You've mentioned that from the beginning. Um, in the in a post COVID uh, nineteen scenario, yeah, how um, how do you envision a, a, a labor policies, uh, the evolution of labor policies, and what could be uh, transformed at least in the in the short term, yeah, uh, in terms of labor labor laws. The so that's one bundle of questions on India. Okay, then there's another one. On uh, specifically on socialism and socialist uh, solutions, you've spoken about that. Uh, I could append to this a question about prop new property forms, the forms of property that might be uh, that, might, that might gain ground in this transition, it be it state state property or collective or co cooperativist uh, forms of, of of production and so forth. Um, so that's another question. Just some more of the uh, the, the the nuts and bolts of this of this transition. Um, there is a question about I think uh, two questions that converge. One is from Argentina, from our friend and the member of the network here, Damian Lobos, uh, who 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 is putting the following question: the the popular government in Argentina uh, says that expansion in the aggregate demand will have to depend on negotiations with the creditors. Yeah. So uh, this puts into perspective the question of external debt. Uh, you've dealt with it, yeah? but perhaps you can just build on that a bit more. The questions of the, the, the countries across the South have a serious external debt problem, big and small countries as well. So uh, the question related to this, there is another question that, uh, uh, from an anonymous uh, member of the of the audience, possible collapse of the monetary system. Um, if linking occurs, I, I will just append to it the question: If the linking does occur, if uh, wages move, go up uh, across the south, if uh, fiscal uh, expenditures uh, increase. Um, it implies shifts in the in the balance of forces on a global level, which uh, will check in somehow the monetary system, which depends, as your work has has so brilliantly shown, depends on um, a compressing demand across the South, especially. So, if that changes, then will, can we expect some kind of collapse or transition in the monetary system? Um, can this find uh, the fact that profits today, profitability of, of capital today depends so much on financial profits? If we actually put constraints on financial profits, will that not uh, smother the, the business? Will that not collapse, have a domino effect on the multinationals that are so financialized today? Just a question. I mean, how do you foresee this transition? Actually, it's a real. It's a real possibility. A collapse is a real possibility of, of, of the financial system. Um, so I think uh, that's and fi the final question with here concerns um, uh, by an anonymous um, uh, uh, member uh, relates to this and the shift of power in world um, in the world economy, in world politics, uh, especially. Uh, in the course of uh, the pandemic, is the pandemic itself uh, a type of veil to war? Is it? Uh, is it, do you sense that uh, uh, we can uh, have a repeat of a war situation, a, a, a global conflagration, as we have had in the past in this in this crisis? Um, so that 
is a resume a, a summary of some of the questions that uh, most of the questions that have come up. Pass it back to you. We have 20 minutes. Okay. Shall I? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll 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 give the India questions to the end. Uh, you know, I I just want to say say one thing that you know that we think of socialism as let's say social ownership of the means of production. Now, when I say that socialism is on the agenda, I don't mean that tomorrow we are going to have social ownership of the means of production. I think of socialism as something which which we arrive at. But the important thing is the political change, the political change of having a state that depends on the support of the working people. And that state confronts imperialism and neoliberal globalization. And then one thing leads to another. It, it, it leads to a series of changes which ultimately bring about what we would call a socialist society. Now, obviously, the moment you have such a government in power, that is not socialism. That is, as it were, an instrument for building socialism. So what exactly such a government should do would depend upon the balance of class forces, what kind of external opposition it faces, what kind of compromises it makes, provided, of course, its compromises are, are not so basic that it does away with the objective itself. So, so the important thing is that when we are talking about a transition to socialism, it's not just socialism is this, and this is the transition we want to make day after tomorrow in order to get out of the crisis. No, I'm, I'm thinking of it as a protracted process. Now, the, so in, in, in that connection, yes, one very important issue that would immediately arise for any left government would be the issue of external debt. And Argentina is a classic example, but in fact, in many countries, Sub-Saharan Africa and so on, you have this issue of external debt. Now, the issue of external debt is one on which we have to put immense pressure on the G20, on the on the on the on the advanced capitalist countries. You know, the amount, the total external debt of 77 poorest countries in the world amounts to no more than just 1% of the GDP of the G20. Now, that being the case, we should, in fact, demand a debt cancellation. We should build up a world movement for the cancellation of, of the debt of these countries. By the way, cancellation of the debt does not mean these countries will become free immediately from the clutches of imperialism because as long as their balance of payments continue to be in current deficit, they would keep on borrowing. And therefore, the debt cancellation today would mean that three three years down the line, again, you'll have a debt buildup. By the way, even the current buildup is because of the, of the collapse in raw material price, in primary commodity prices that I referred to earlier. Much of this buildup has taken place over the last kind of, you know, since 2011. And, and as a result, you find that, that you know, but even so, we have to demand. That we have to demand that, that, that also policies are put into place, which do not make these countries dependent as before on uh, foreign borrowing and so on. You know, it'll involve a number of things. It'll involve, for instance, the South, southern countries getting together in order to mutually provide each other with goods rather than being dependent on imports from the north. And so so that will require a whole new alternative economic strategy. But all that has to be part of confronting the problem of external dependence. Uh, then there was a the question of collapse of the money. Yes, any attack by the people of the South by way of delinking from financial globalization, by way of, of increasing food self-sufficiency and so on, would necessarily mean that it would be an attack on uh, the hegemony of finance. And this might actually mean all kinds of financial crisis in the North itself. 
but on the other hand that is an issue that you know i mean that is something that that cannot hold us back i think that is something that therefore our northern comrades would have to take up and make sure that that they change their societies in a similar manner to overcome the hegemony of finance in in other words uh, like lenin had talked about uh, you know breaking the imperialist chain at the weakest link we have to break it wherever in the south it is possible to have such a state such a government that is supported by workers and peasants but at the same time uh, this is going to create challenges for the north but then this should actually lead to demands in the north for overcoming the hegemony of finance in those countries the point i was trying to make which i think is is a point which is worth keeping in mind is that you know that that we are now in a situation where neoliberal globalization has reached a dead end now that that basically means that everywhere is going to get into a crisis everywhere therefore there would be demands for a change in the nature of the society these are i mean unfortunately we cannot think in terms of a world revolution because obviously the, the movements all over the world are not coordinated we can think in terms of a revolution or a change in the entire balance of forces that is local but on the other hand these should trigger similar changes elsewhere the fact that similar changes are not occurring elsewhere is something that should not deter us from going ahead with the changes that we are able to enforce um now this also brings me uh, to the question of this global confederation you know one of the things one of the things that the bourgeoisie could think of now is to actually you know a nation state cannot confront globalized finance but you if, if you had a global state the global state could confront globalized finance you don't have a globalized bourgeois state but on the other hand you could think in terms of a coordinated set of bourgeois states acting together to thwart globalized finance and to introduce let us say fiscal measures to introduce public investment in order to get out of the crisis so this is something which nobody is even thinking of in other words this idea itself in the 1930s this was being talked about but today even this idea is absent because of which is very important for for the south for countries of the south to delink and to later on relink with a globalization of an alternative kind which would of course be a socialist globalization or shall we say a democratic globalization not an imperialist globalization i think i'll stop there oh sorry the india questions the india question yeah you, you know the in yeah okay i mean the india questions obviously we now have a fascist government the fascist government is something which is propped up by globalized finance propped up by elements of the domestic corporate financial oligarchy and and as a result the struggle for democratic rights the struggle for labor rights the struggle for human rights the struggle for freeing political prisoners the struggle for the right to express yourself the constitutional right to freedom of speech all these get merged all these get merged and 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 as a result i believe that we have to work for a merger of all these in order to put up a challenge to the bjp government and when the challenge is 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 you know is successful then we get rid of the government we get rid of the laws on the which this government is actually putting dissenters in jail and we similarly uh, reverse the labor laws that it has introduced or you know the, the 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 subversion of labor laws it has introduced we reverse the subversion and so on and 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 then we think of an agenda whereby food production can be increased whereby agricultural production can be increased whereby peasants have to be supported by the state and so on uh so so all that agenda would 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 follow but basically all these struggles get linked now there is no separate struggle of the laborers from the struggle of the dalits from the struggle of the women from from the struggle 
of the Muslims and so on, because all of them come together. And fascism in that sense has this role of uniting the entire opposition. I'll stop there, yeah. Thank you. There, um, there, if, um, uh, there is uh, there's some other questions that have come in. Uh, maybe there's one that you have uh, addressed or in some way you have addressed, came in from um, uh, Sandeep Chatra from Action Aid about this uh, changing uh, uh, in the balance of forces. Um, uh, which is happening on a global scale uh, and which uh, perhaps on popular lines is something more that something that um, uh, uh, will move faster in the, in the coming months um, ahead. Um, unless you, I think more or less touched on this or you know, maybe you would like to speak. There's also some other questions about leaning parties. Uh, in Southern Africa, there's some questions about uh, uh, virtually there are no left-leaning parties. Um, is this something that uh, can uh, can it be a a, a a a a a growth with the movement on a global scale of 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 uh, changing the relation of forces in local in local spaces, countries, and so forth? You know. Okay, the, the, the absence of left-wing political parties or, you know, clearly left-wing political parties, powerful left-wing political parties at a certain point of time is something that doesn't worry me too much because after all, you know, the crucial thing, as I keep emphasizing, is the fact that neoliberalism has come to a dead end. When it has come to a dead end and is meeting with a crisis, people are going to be obviously revolting against this crisis. When they do revolt against this crisis, the balance of class forces, which may today appear to be strongly tilted in favor of the capitalist, the big capitalist, is something that tomorrow would, would, would change in a different direction. This history can move in a moment, completely undoing, as it were, something which was, which was you know, occurring let's say over decades uh, and 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 so so that and and likewise you can have suddenly political parties forces emerging out of these classes these opposing resistant classes which then can actually suddenly become far more powerful. I mean, this is something which has been shown again and again. On the contrary, it's even possible to argue that existing left-wing parties, you know, those which remain very powerful and so on, can even be a hindrance to the movement of the people. I mean, think of the German Social Democratic Party, which had 86 dailies at the time of the First World War. But on the other hand, I mean, it was a massive party but on the other hand, when the workers, when the First World War happened, the majority of that party decided to support its particular state in the war. So, so the thing is that, you know, history can change quickly. Situations can change very quickly. Uh, but the important thing is the situation today is not the same as existed yesterday, day before, five years, ten years ago. Five years, ten years ago, there was a certain kind of support as far as neoliberal globalization was concerned. Middle class supported it because it was a beneficiary of it. The, even the poor supported it because they were told that there's a trickle down effect. That okay, you are going to get get some benefits tomorrow, even if you haven't got the benefits today. But now that is gone. Since that is gone, you'd find that actually the prospects of change become much brighter. The prospects of shifting the balance of class forces much right. Okay, I, I, I'll stop. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, this uh, actually brings us to the question of our two. Um, and um, I wish to thank you. Uh, for this uh, wonderful talk, uh, for sharing your thoughts on this very crucial moment um, in history, which uh, for good or for bad, we're going to have to live through. <laughs>
we are the generation that we have to see through this one. Um, and we do need rigorous reflection, such as uh, of the kind that you have been uh, promoting and, and publishing and writing uh, for so long. Uh, you are uh, uh, a key uh, for uh, everything we do. Uh, we always consult your work uh, um, on all these um, very difficult questions that are and fundamental questions that are emerging uh, now. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to also thank our uh, audience uh, who stayed with us for for the two hours. Uh, I just would like to uh, let you know that uh, this next session, this is going to happen every two weeks uh, for an indefinite period of time. Uh, next session will be on the 29th of July. We will have this with the uh, and we'll also have uh, at, during that session a launch, a global launch of uh, uh, with uh, Saida Yahi Othman and Gwaza Kmata on, uh, which is a biography on uh, of, uh, Julius Nyerere. The book is uh, entitled Development as Rebellion. So we will have a book launch in the, on the 29th, and uh, this will be followed by a talk um, by Isa Shivji, Problems of Nationalism, today. Um, Lynn, do you have Lynn? Do you have any further uh, comments? Lynn. No. Okay. I think your video is turned off. But okay. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you all you. very much. Thank you, Professor Padnaik. And we'll see you again soon. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.